who trust in me, but your kids. Amen. Love you guys. Amen. All right, kids are free to go upstairs. There's so much wicked in the world. <clears throat> I had a revelation of that when I was praying for these kids. There's so much wicked in the world. <clears throat> and we have to take that. Kids church. So seriously. It's not just playtime. It's not just go upstairs and get out of our way. It's probably I'd say the most important ministry we do. Yeah. Amen. We're good. Amen. Amen. Let me get my stuff together. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> if you have your scripture, if you have your Bible, please open up to, um, we'll be in Matthew 21 starting out today. Um, so you can go ahead and open your scripture or your phone there and just kind of get your place. So, Hosanna in the highest, the perfect Lamb of God. So Palm Sunday is the day that we remember and reflect and and uh, recognize everyone like and recognize this triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Uh, when when for the first time, get this, when for the first time Jesus allowed himself to be exalted and praised as the Messiah. You know, Jesus never allowed people to do that before them, for this moment in history. Jesus always told the ones who got healed, take the back way home and don't tell anybody what happened. Uh, keep us between us. I don't want, it's not my time. My time has not come yet. And here's Jesus. My time has come. He's, he's owning the moment. He's owning his, his stature as the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus, God's only son. Significant. It's very significant um, that he allowed people to exalt him. <clears throat> when people yelled shouts, I wanted to have my, my bow up here. People, people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. Here's Jesus riding in on a, a colt, a foal of a donkey, um, to the chairs and the adoration of, of everybody around. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, which, which literally means save us. Save us, God. Save us. You're here from God and you're here to save us. We recognize you. As the one that's come to fulfill God's mission. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. You know, this was the first time people publicly praised him. It was also the last time that people publicly praised him. With the exception of some mocking at the cross. This time period between what we've celebrated today, I didn't click the button right. Hosanna in the highest. Save, save us, our Messiah, who comes to fulfill God's mission. So this time period from, from today until next Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And, and this is a, we don't even debate this, this is the most influential, important, powerful week in human history. Put them all together. And this week is more, more important to the, to the, human, the, the race of humanity than any other, you know, with the exception of the birth. The birth of Christ would be up there, but but the birth would be uh, insignificant without this week. This is the week. So this week literally changed the course of, of history. It changed it changed the course of humanity. It changed our eternity. Do we get that? This day is, is the beginning of the week that changed humanity forever. It changed where where we can spend the rest of our days as Gentiles. You and I as Gentiles. Sinners, people far from God. This is this is our this is our Messiah. It would be easy to miss the significance of this day, and I don't want to understate it because it's so it's so important. One week period changed the course of the world. You know, in our world, it's easy. It's easy to just overlook things, isn't it? Just to, it's another Sunday, one church or, or not, you know, it's just another week. 
Another day. We might, we might think of, the, of, of Palm Sunday as, as just the Sunday before Easter and a reminder to get the Easter baskets for the kids or, or as a kind of a, to trip our memory, oh, we gotta buy the ham for Easter dinner. Or, or maybe Palm Sunday holds no significance to us at all. And, and I, I think that's probably not too uncommon. My hope is that today through this, through this message, through, through God's scripture, we'll get a deeper understanding and in turn a deeper appreciation for, for what this day is specifically and what this week represents. This holy week. But by looking at the day in its original context and setting, we're going we're gonna to get um, an idea of Jesus' ultimate mission, wide angle view of what Jesus' ultimate mission was. The Savior, the true Lamb of God, the King of Kings, on, on his way to face the inevitable. I also believe that by understanding the original setting and context of, of the day in Scripture, of this one event, our hearts will become even softer and drawn closer to Jesus. I, I hope that's what happens today. So our Scripture is Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. I'll read it. It says, When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. And they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spraying them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus. From Nazareth in Galilee. So to better understand the true meaning of this triumphal entry, we must first understand its correlation to the to the feast of the Passover, the Passover feast. Um, in, in Jewish culture at the time, they had three big feasts, three big things: they had the Passover feast, the Pentecost feast, and the Tabernacle feast. This this feast, the purpose of of this feast, the the Passover feast, was to Commemorate their deliverance from Egypt, right? We all know that the ancient, the ancient Israelites were in bondage in Egypt. They were slaves, and they they weren't allowed to do what they wanted to. Do. They weren't allowed to be God's people. They were slaves to the Egyptians. The, the biblical account of, of the first Passover is in Exodus twelve, and I wanted to share a little bit out of Exodus twelve because it's by understanding this that we're going to understand Passover and in turn Palm Sunday. So Exodus 12, 1 through 8 says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month is to be the beginning of the months for you. It is the first month of your year. Tell the, tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day, get this, on the tenth day of this month, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their father's family. One animal per family. If the household is too small for a whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest the house are to select one animal based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each will eat. You must have an unblemished animal, a one-year-old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day. Get that? So the 10th day they find a sheep or a lamb. The 14th day they keep the sheep. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. They must take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses where they eat them. They are to eat the meat that night. They should eat it roasted over the fire of unleavened bread and bitter herbs. God doesn't leave a lot of open-ended things, does he? This is how it's to be done. Exactly. This is how you cook it. This is how you do it. This is exactly what I want you to do. 
I wish I could speak clearly like that sometimes. So on the 10th day, let's get the calendar out. So on the 10th day of the month, they select the Passover lamb. Okay. This is the 10th day. For four days, the lamb stays in their homes. Sleeping under the table, eating out of the dog bowl. I'm joking. Whatever. <laughs> just, just around the house. They keep it. They, they get to know it. They might, the kids might name it. Judy the lamb. You know, whatever. We, they keep the lamb. And on, on the, the fifth day, the lamb is slain at twilight. The blood is used on the lamps, on the doorposts, and the lamb is eaten. It's got to be a perfect lamb, too. It's got to be one without blemish. It can't be your, your mangy, old, dirty one. It's got to be a perfect one. The best one you have, a year old. Bring it to your home. Keep it for four days. On the fifth day, slaughter it eat <clears throat> And if they did this, if the, if the Jews did this, God says, the destroyed angel that I'm going to send for judgment on Egypt will pass your house by. He'll, the angel will pass over your home, and you'll be, you'll be safe from judgment. Thus, thus the name Passover. It was all about the lamb. They had to have the lamb. And the blood of the lamb. Without the blood of the lamb, without the blood of the lamb on the post, they were facing the judgment that, that Egypt was facing. But with the blood, they will be spared. And every year after this, the Israelites celebrated Passover. They got a lamb. They slaughtered it. They ate the meat. Just the same fashion as God directed them in the beginning. This was a big deal. Passover was a, is a big deal for, for their culture. God made a way. God, made a, God gave his people a path to freedom. They were stuck in bondage. And he said, this is the way to freedom. Do as I say. He made a way for, he made provisions to overcome the world. We got that. So moving forward to the triumphal entry, to Jesus' entr entrance into Jerusalem. The people were looking forward to a coming Messiah. Uh, they were waiting. They had been waiting for a long time for, for a Messiah that was going to come. And they believed he would come about this exact time during the Passover. They prayed for it. They seek God. They ate for this Messiah. Because life wasn't good as an Israelite. It wasn't good. They were, they were ruled by Rome. They might have had their own city, but it wasn't theirs. Rome told them what to do, when to do it, how they could live. And so they, they desired this Messiah from God who would come and set things right. Change, change their life and, and win back their freedom. And give them everything they, they felt like they, they deserved as God's chosen people. God promised it, and he always comes through in his promises, correct? correct? So, with this background in mind, we kind of set the table here. Let's take a look at the events that I read in, in, in Matthew 21, um, and the other events that surrounded the triumphal entry. So, shortly before the Passover, Jesus and his disciples, Jesus and his disciples began their journey from, uh, from Bethpage uh, to Jerusalem. Likewise, many Jews, almost every Jew that could, came to Jerusalem that day it was it, for that week. That's where you went. If, if you were a, a Jew with your weight in feathers, you, you made it to Jerusalem for Passover. That's what you did. And so the city was packed. It was a full town. You know, no six-foot distancing going on. They were, they were full. So a lot of people would stay in Jerusalem that could, but the other people would stay around, like in the Garden of Olives or, or in, in Bethpage or wherever they could find room. Jesus and his disciples stayed in the city of Bethany, the little town of Bethany, um, which is the town where we know the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I want to share that account, too, because it's important in the story. John 11, 39 through 44 says, this is Jesus speaking uh, about a tomb where Lazarus is buried. He said, remove the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, get this, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Do we know that? 
If we believe, we will see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you hear me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowds getting here, I said this so that they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound with hands and feet, with linen strips, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. As you can imagine, Somebody dead in a cave for four days was just brought back to life, and now the news is spreading like wildfire. Jesus, did you hear what Jesus did? Remember Lazarus? Jesus brought him back to life. He called him out of the tomb, and his, at the words of Jesus, he came back to life. Well, it must be a coincidence. It must be his mansion. No, Jesus said, come to life, and he did. He told Lazarus to come out of the cave, and he did. This news would be life-changing for the Jews. And all of a sudden, this guy who they've heard about, Jesus, who they've, they've heard about his teaching, they've seen some of his miracles, now all of a sudden, he's dealing with life and death. And he's bringing life where there was none. And all of a sudden, the eyes are being opened. Maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the promised Messiah. And, the, and look at what the day, this could be him. This could be the day we're waiting for. This could be the promised Savior. Good news travels fast, doesn't it? Good news travels fast. Jerusalem was in uproar because they heard the news of what Jesus had done. People begin to believe this, this really is the promised Messiah. This is him. Jesus must be the one who is coming to free Israel from our current bondage. To bring physical freedom to this nation because we don't have freedom. As Jesus and his disciples made their way, climbed over the Mount of Olives, and approached Jerusalem. It says the people cut the branches. They threw their clothes down and cut palm branches just like these and laid them on the road as Jesus rode the donkey through. Palm branches symbolize something special. Symbolize goodness. This palm branch means goodness. When you wave this palm branch, it means victory. It means we're going to win. It means the king has arrived and we're going to win. Amen. Our Savior has come. This is what this means. This wasn't just because it was the easiest thing they had. The palm branch means power. And it means we, we have finally found our king. Grandeur, steadfastness, and victory. The, the palm branch was, was often depicted on coins and on walls uh, and on different places. King Solomon carved palm branches into the, uh, into the door of the temple. It says he carved all the surrounding temple walls with carved engravings, cherubim, palm trees, and flower blossoms in the inner and outer sanctuaries. The palm branch was significant. It was a big deal. To throw this at somebody's feet and say, Hosanna, Hosanna! It means I'm, I'm hooking my wagon to you, Jesus. You're the one. You're my savior. I'm choosing you. The people had a, a vision of Jesus coming in conquering Rome with power and military force and driving these dirty Romans out and, and restoring freedom to the nation of Israel. And Jesus is the one. He's got it. He can bring the dead back to life. He can definitely cast Rome out of our face. He can do it. Jews had an expectation of what their Messiah would be like. They had an expectation of what their Messiah would do. He would give us freedom. And, and, and get the significance of this timing is, is unmistakable. According to the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the day that Jesus triumphantly, triumphantly entered Jerusalem was the tenth day. The day Jews were supposed to select their Passover lamb. So Jesus entering in Jerusalem, being Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, palm branches thrown at his feet. Is symbolic of, of Jesus being chose, chosen as the Lamb of Israel. The true Lamb of God rode into Israel and our world to Jerusalem and was chosen as the Passover Lamb. Chosen by the people. Also, just as the lambs 
would be brought to the homes for four days. Jesus was in the temple for four days teaching, in his father's house teaching. This act of worship by the Jews during the triumphal entry of waving the branches, praising Jesus, and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, fulfilled the, the prophecy in Zechariah stated in 9 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout and triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's all good, right? Jesus is here. We've got our Messiah. Let's just sit back and watch Jesus do his work. Once the day is followed between Palm Sunday and what we call Easter, the Jews grew impatient. Imagine he brought thunder and lightning from the sky and blasted these Romans out of here. What is he doing? And they began to realize Jesus didn't come to have military, a military battle. He didn't come to conquer Rome. He wasn't the Messiah they even wanted. And they realized Jesus wouldn't bring them the physical, political freedom they so desired. The people of Israel learned in the scriptures. They were learning. They were learning in the scriptures. They knew the scripture, memorized it. They knew prophecy. They had that memorized too. They were fully informed about the scripture and what's to come and what to expect. But they didn't understand the true deliverance that Jesus would bring through his atonement, death, and resurrection. They had no idea of their true need. They were so focused in, focused right now, they, they missed the big picture. They missed why Jesus came, why he entered Jerusalem that day. They had no idea of their true bondage and sin. They understood bondage and slavery, but they didn't, didn't get the bondage they were currently living in sin. Just as stuck, just as trapped. They didn't understand that Jesus came to restore them to their father, not to restore them to their, to their, to their soil. Only five days later, some of these same people who were waving palm branches saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, five days later would say, crucify him, crucify him. He's a, he's a fraud, he's false, he's a fake prophet, he's not who he says he is. Because he didn't do what I thought he should do. He didn't beat Rome, he didn't defeat this enemy. Here we are four days later and he hasn't done a thing. He's not who he thought. We tend to look back at the Jews, don't we, and say, poor souls. We have judgment in our eyes and say, how, how hard-hearted could you be, Israel? How blind could you be, Jerusalem? How fickle? How could they ever miss this? They knew their scripture. They knew prophecy. They knew what to expect. And they still missed it because their expectations were wrong. Jesus lived in their midst, and they never knew God was there. My heart aches for Israel, if you think about it like that. Not because they murdered Jesus, because that, that was prophesied. That was, that was what had to happen. We understand that, but it aches because I see, I see us in them. I see the church in Israel. I see America and Israel. We have a very similar view of, of, of what's going on as Israel did. I have expectations. I have things I need done by my Savior. I've got business for him. Let me ask a question. What type of Messiah are you hoping for? What type of Messiah do you expect? When you said yes to Jesus and you said, Hosanna, save me, save me, Lord. And, and in your heart, you, you waved your palm branch and said yes to Jesus. What were you expecting? Did you have some expectations? Jesus, I'll, I'll say yes to you because I need this. I need freedom. I need hope. I need whatever it is. Do we expect our Messiah to get busy right now? I said yes, Jesus, so where are you at? Why am I still struggling with sin? Why am I still, why, why isn't my, my daughter healed? Why isn't everything working out now, Jesus? I said yes. Do your part. 
They expect him to, to fix the wrongs, to take us a lot of the challenges and the trials, and to do it now. We're a lot like Israel in that way. If he doesn't do what I need him to do, when I need him to do it, then he can't possibly be a savior. That's some wrong thinking. Let me ask you this. Do we expect our Messiah to heal when we pray? Yeah. Do we expect our Messiah to speak when we ask him to speak? Yeah. Do we expect him to move mountains when we're back to our corner? Yes. And those are all good things. The Bible says to pray with expectancy. To believe it and you, believe you have received it. When you pray it, believe it and you will receive it. The Bible says pray that way. That's how we're supposed to pray. Believing it and trusting Jesus for it. But we don't give Jesus a list and say, God, this is what I need. Take care of this and then I'll, I'll be there. I'll follow you. Take care of this list and then I'll be yours. That's not how he works. Jesus calls us to follow him, to humble ourselves, to break ourselves for him and follow him. And he builds us full. He strengthens us. He makes it right. The plan that Jesus has for you and had for the people of Israel is so far superior than, than what they were asking for. They were just asking for a military victory. Jesus had eternity in mind. The same is true for you. The plan that Jesus has for your life is so much greater than this momentary victory in your life that you're asking for. He's got eternity in mind. See, Jesus starts with eternity and works back to you. You start with your little spot and work to eternity, and it doesn't always match up. Do we have eternity in our minds? Are we thinking with eternity in our minds? If we do, the, the, the trials and the troubles and the challenges of the day take less and less power over us. They're insignificant. Yeah, car broke down. Yeah, house payment didn't get made. Yeah, taxes overdue. Whatever it may be. Yeah, I lost, I lost a loved one. But if we have eternity in mind and we believe that Jesus is who he said he is, and he'll do what he said he'll do, then those things aren't a big deal because we're going home eventually. We have eternity in mind. We have eternity in our hearts, and we're thinking that way all the time. The little tribulations and trials right now are so insignificant compared to what's ahead for you. Just like the Jews in Egypt, you have an Exodus story. You have a, a Passover lamb whose blood brought you out of bondage. Because we all had times where we were st stuck in sin. We were stuck somewhere, and it was the blood of Christ that brought us through. We all, we all have an Exodus story, just like Israel, where we once were one way, and then Jesus happened, and now we're something different. We, have, we all have been there. We all have lived that. We just can't get stuck in, in Jesus, do it my way. You know, in, my, in, in my years of, uh, of being in Christ, Jesus has never done anything the way I thought he should. He never did it my way. He always did it so much better and, and so much more completely and so much more powerfully and so much more rewarding. How God does what God does is up to him. It's not us. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us, through the Holy Spirit power within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we can think or ask or imagine or dream about or hope for. He can do more. And so why would we make Jesus fit in our box of what we think a Messiah should be? When he's got so much greater plans for you. Such greater plans for your family. Such greater plans for your eternity. You know, Israel got into this, this rut of things aren't happening fast enough. Even back to even back to most of the day. Things aren't happening fast enough. So let's let's make us a, a gold cow that we can worship because then at least we can control it. If you need to control it, you're gonna struggle with your faith because faith means Jesus does it. We follow, he does it. He makes it happen. And we're obedient. That's how that's how our relationship is. That's our that's our uh, posture relationship. He does the work. We're obedient. And if he says go, we go. If he says stop, we stop. 
We cannot project our own physical limitations of what a Savior is on Jesus because we're going to miss it. We're going to miss the great work he wants to do. So what does this mean for us? How do we, how do we apply this to you and me in 2021? Well, first we have the opportunity each day to wave our palm branch and select Jesus as our Lamb of God. And invite him into our homes, into our hearts, to be our Passover Lamb. When we lay down our all before him and trust him alone, we are choosing to accept him as Savior. That means we lay it all down. Our expectations, our plans, our, our agendas, we lay it all down before him and trust him. Jesus, I just trust you. I don't know what you've got planned. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't see how this is going to be good for anyone, but I trust you. Can we get to that point? Can we get to that point in our life where we just say, you know what, I trust you, Jesus. Because I, I tried on my own and I failed. Only then can we be spared from the destruction of our sin. Do we understand that there's destruction coming for our sin? If we're left alone in our sin, without the blood of the Lamb, on our doorpost of our heart, we're headed for destruction. We're headed for death. It's by this triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into your heart, the triumphal entry of Jesus into your heart, that we choose freedom over bondage, we choose life over death. That's about all I have to say about that.